So I want to talk today about prayer, and I want to talk about different things in prayer. And some I'll just mention, and I'll go right on to the next one, because we've got a lot of things to cover. But the theme today, the level of commitment determines the outcome. The level of commitment determines the outcome. Now we know that in our prayer life, we must be motivated by the Spirit of God. We must have the Spirit of God in it. Now, not that the, the, you're going to hear a big thunder in the sky when you start praying or anything, but we know that the sons of God have to be led by the Spirit of God in things. We know that. So we need the Holy Ghost in helping us. It says that he'd bring to remembrance all things that Jesus said. And how many know that one of those things is a way to pray? Jesus taught him how to pray. Taught him what was important in pray. That prayer that you give God praise. You give him thanks. And he's, he's a holy God. So lift up his holy name just like we said here. But that we as people would humble ourselves and, 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 and be moved and be led by the Spirit of God in prayer. Now, Wednesday night, we talked about the, the groaning of the Spirit in when we pray, and that we heard that there was breakthroughs in prayer when people quit using words, because sometimes words aren't good enough, but the Spirit of God wants to groan through you with travail, like Paul travailed for the Galatians again, Sometimes travail in the spirit is weeping before the Lord. Do we not all agree with that? So we know that sometimes there's different levels of all that that doesn't have words. Different levels that don't have words to it. That there's a groan before the Lord. There's a travail before the Lord. There is also a mighty roar before the Lord as a mighty man of war that declares war and also is war against the enemy. That when a mighty man of war roars, that the Spirit of God roars with him and brings the walls down. When you hear the trumpets blow after you've marched around seven times, shout, roar. That's how you can... Translate that, roar, and the walls will come down. Not one time, not two times, seven times, and then do, Joshua said, do exactly what I say. Amen. Do exactly what the Spirit of God wants you to do. So what people do is they read that passage, and they just start roaring. Well, sometimes it's a hit and a miss because God says, and most of the time it's more of a miss because God says, I, I don't want you to march around. That isn't what the Spirit of God is doing. I don't want you to roar. That's not what the Spirit of God wants out of you right now. And I know, I knew of a church that they did nothing but roar and they lost their voices and they were losing their voices and everything was the roar. Well, there is a truth there, but the devil took and ran with it. It's kind of like casting out demons. People that get, oh, wow, that's really real. And that's all they do is warfare. That's when the devil takes, and he takes them clear out of bounds. And they're not balanced, and it isn't God. It's demonic right now. Can we all agree with that? Amen. All right. So there's different things that we can do. We know that we got to get close to God. we got to be close to God. And not only that, God will take us into deeper levels of him. Well, why do we need that? Well, you want God, don't you? You want God to hear you, don't you? Or do we want just to be complaining all the time, where's my God at? How come God isn't answering my prayers? And every one of us wonder that. Could the key be that you're not getting deeper, you're not getting the anointing of God on you as you should? You're not letting the people, a person pray over you or the elder of the church pray over you when you need it, like Philip. He called Peter and John down. They sent him down to fill him with the Holy Ghost. We talked about that. Isn't it the steps that make all the difference? Isn't it the anointing that makes all the difference? Isn't the call in your life that makes all the difference? And you're not alone. You're with each person. Amen? Now, there's a lot that I'm saying right there. So only ones that are going to understand that is ones that have listened to me. 
But Jesus was going to go ahead and choose the 12 apostles. He was going to choose them. Out of all the midst of his followers. And what did he do? He went into a mountain and he prayed all night. He prayed all night. Jesus, your Lord, which is God, prayed all night that heaven would come down and help him to pick all the 12. That he'd be walking in the spirit. Isn't that amazing? He did the same thing when he walked on water. And Peter came out of the boat. That he walked in the miraculous, but he prayed all night. He sent the multitude away. Listen to this. He sent the multitude away after he fed the five and four thousand. And he went and he prayed. And at the, at, the, at the fourth watch, he came walking out on the water. Three in the morning, he's walking on the water. And they're all out there struggling. Now, I want you to see that Jesus, before he even made a decision, who his apostles were going to be, he prayed all night. He's God. How about you praying all night? How about you praying all night? Amen. Oh, pastor. I get tired after the first, like, I mean, half hour, it's like, what am I going to say? After the first 10 minutes, I've said what I'm going to say. You know, like, where do we go with this? Can you see how shallow we are? Isn't that their need? I mean, Jesus, what was he doing that he was praying on? Well, he was God. Huh? No, no. Peter couldn't pray for an hour. You see how weak he was? Peter, James, and John at the Garden of Gethsemane, they couldn't pray an hour. And Jesus says, pray and watch. Pray and watch. And he says, he come back to him three times. Can't you pray? <laughs> Is that, is that not us? Maybe we're not snoring, but aren't we that shallow? Sometimes, oh, I'm talking about today, that there's things that we need to do. There's things that we need to do, and we need to see that others do it. That we'd have a deep understanding of God. Keep in mind, everything that I'm going to say, got to be led of God. Some people declare, I'm praying all night. And God says, I'm not in it. I'm not in it this time. I, you know, I'm going to honor you, but I'm not in you praying all night. And then there's times you go, golly, I woke up in the middle of the night, and I just felt like I needed to pray. So I took another sleeping pill and went back to sleep. <laughs> That's really true. Or I just rolled over, and you missed it. You missed it. Then you wake up the next day, and you hear the bad news, and it's like, how could that have happened? It's like, well, God had you praying and wanted you to pray at 3 in the morning or 2 in the morning or midnight, and you rolled over. And you knew you were supposed to pray. You really felt you were supposed to pray. But we're so out of the Spirit, when the Spirit wants to move us, we're not used to it. And so we go to our happy meal instead of going where God is at to the answer of prayer. So... The level of commitment determines the outcome, but it must be in the spirit. Esther said this, the Jews are going to die, right? They're going to be killed by Haman. They're going to they're, they're be slaughtered. And so what did Esther do? She declared a fast after she was persuaded. He, she says, her uncle says, if you don't do it, Mordecai said, if you don't do it, who knows, God will get somebody else to save his people, but you and your household will be destroyed. Mordecai, uh, hey, now Mordecai is telling her that you got a job to do and you better get it done. So this is what she says. You get all the Jews together and tell them that they are to fast for three days. You don't eat anything, you don't drink anything. Now that is being led of the Holy Spirit. Can we agree with that? Amen. Esther was being led by the Holy Spirit to say, I got an end with the king, but this is not good that I got to go to the king and I got to talk to him about the lives of all these Jews and we need the king to decide right. So neither eating or drinking for three days. We know that you can go three days without drinking water. A healthy person. Amen? I don't know. You maybe don't be, need to be that healthy. You just see the level. I want you to see the level. No eating, no drinking. I've done that. I think I only did it one time. And I was telling Susanna, when I got off my fast at the end of three days, I went to Baby Bulls and I said, give me a tall glass of milk. And I ordered a big meal. Thank God for Baby Bulls. <laughs> anyway, and I remember taking the first drink of that cold milk. It was cold. It was almost freezing. 
and it hit my tongue, and I just thought, thank you, God, that tasted so good. It tasted so good. But the fact was, is that that was a time in my life that I needed to do everything I knew knew to do, and so I did it. Amen? Amen. Paul goes on the road to Damascus to kill the, to kill the Christians and to take them, take them back to Jerusalem, throw them in, the, in jail and this and that, and he gets knocked off his horse, and this man wasn't stupid. He was just wrong in his beliefs. How many know people like that? They're very brilliant, but they just haven't got it together. See, you can be a person that's not the smartest tool in the shop, But you got it together in the spirit. And that is all that matters. Well, this is what Paul did. Very smart man. And he went into a fast. And he neither ate or drank anything. Why? Well, the Lord knocked him off his horse. Have you been knocked off your horse? You felt like your horse is going down and you're walking? Amen? Amen. You feel like there's times in your life that you've been knocked down? Amen? We all have. What was your reaction to that immediately? Well, I went to church and I just cried to everybody. Okay. Well, at least you went to church. What was your reaction to that? What in the blankety blank is going on, God? I've heard people say that. What is going on? Where's my God at? Is that something that Paul would have said? No, that isn't what Paul said. He went right into a fast. He went right into a fast, and he didn't drink a thing. The level of commitment determines the outcome. That's a good commitment right there. No eat, no drink. Nineveh is going to be destroyed. What the king say? Nothing eats. Nothing eats. God is judging this place, and we believe that man. We believe that prophet that came to town and said that. So he says, no cattle eat. Oh, no cattle eat. Everything gets sackcloth, so you better find some. Was that a king that understood the level of commitment that it was going to take? So God's judgment would come. What, what about this? Let's just say 10% of the people. Fasted. Would Nineveh have been, oh, God's going to do it anyway. He's going to destroy us, or God's going to go ahead and, and relieve us anyway. And he, he's a good God. He's not going to do anything. What if only 10%? What if not all the people? And it said that God looked down and he saw that they had turned from their wicked ways. They quit sitting and they went into what? Fasting. Nothing ate. Nothing ate. Not even the cattle. Well, Guernsey won't let her milk down tomorrow. You're not drinking milk anyway, so it doesn't make any difference. (laughs) If you know anything about milking cows, I used to milk cows, so I understand that. You get them all riled up, and you get about half as much as what you normally would. Nothing eats, nothing drinks. Is that you when you hear bad news? Nothing eats, nothing drinks. Where's your level of commitment? Elijah, Elijah's, you know, he flees from Jezebel. 40 days, you know, you heard, heard, he, he ate that food that was made by the angel. He flees, he goes in, he sees the earthquake, he feels the earthquake, sees the fire, sees the wind, and he come, and before he comes out, and God wants to talk to him, And he finds out God was not in any of those big explosions going on outside. And what does he do? I want you to see this. He wraps his face, his mantle, he wraps it up because it was a sign of humility before the Lord. I am nothing and you are everything. And it was in the still small voice, but he didn't come out and talk to God until his face was covered. Well, what does that have to do to me? I don't have a mantle. That's the level of humility that he's shown before the Lord. I'll give you another one. That is New Testament. Paul says, 
He says that when a woman covers her head, it's a sign to God and the angels, those above her, that she is under submission. And then she prays. Have you women ever felt like I need to find something and put it on my head to show that I am one in submission to God. I need an answer to my prayer. You don't do it all the time, but you know why you don't do it? You never were taught. And our mainline church has never taught us the importance of it. I need an answer to my prayer. And you went and you picked up the shawl and you put it over your head and you started praying to God. I submit to authority. I submit to you. I submit to those that are over me. This is my sign, God. I humble myself. Just like Elijah put his mantle over his face. Now I'm going to go talk to God. Do you ever feel like now I can go talk to God? I see people that do that. I've had, I've had people that have done it. We taught on that years ago. And it got to be a ritual. Don't put it on unless the Spirit of God tells you, now's the time to put it on. You go, oh, what's that action mean for anything? God don't care about that stuff. Well, then why do you kneel? Then why do you kneel? Now, I'll say it again. Why do you kneel? Well, I don't kneel. You should. <laughs> Nature tells us that it's wrong for a man to sit in church with his ball hat on, or his cap, cap on, ball cap. We look at him and say, don't you have any respect to God? Take that thing off. As we walk behind, we just flip it off for him. We don't think it. We wouldn't say it. We would never even, but we think, the devil says, moron. What? Unlearned. That's all it is. Ignorant, you don't do some things. When you come to church, you have understanding before God. So, for the women, for the women, I feel like I need to put a head covering on her. Remember when Susanna did it once? I said, you know, here's a, here's a prayer shawl. You ever think about doing that? She says, I put it on and my head just cleared up. And it seemed like heaven came down. Maybe the husband was suggesting something that needed to be done right that time, right at that time. Paul said, oh, men ought to always pray everywhere. Lifting what? Feet to the air? Holy hands to God? Men should pray everywhere. Why? Why? Why does kneeling, why does lifting my hands to God make any difference? God thinks it makes a difference. That's why it makes a difference. Well, I was never, I was never taught that. That's why your prayers lots of times are not getting that answered. It's a sign of submission. It's a sign of humility. Why? Why? Because that's the way it is. That's the way it is. When Elijah prayed for rain, and there was no rain for several years because he cut it off. Ahab was after him over this whole thing. And he says, he told Ahab, take courage, I smell rain. I smell rain. So what did he do? What did he do? He went and prayed. But what did he do? How did he pray? How did he pray? Well, it was before the cross, Pastor. Just forget that stuff, all right? He sat down on the ground... It says he cast himself to the ground and he put his head between his knees. Well, that's crazy. Nobody does that anymore. That's right. Nobody does that anymore. But does God change? He raised a guy from the dead. Have you? When it was a drought and he prayed, and he kept praying. And he sent a guy. What does it look like? He says, there's nothing. He prayed again, prayed again. And he prayed again. And he, then he said, go. And he says, looks like a hand in the sky. And the rains came. 
But how did he pray with his head bowed down? It says in the Bible that the people of Israel, we, I want you to get this now. You should be writing this down. You really cannot remember this stuff. When the people prayed, they lifted holy hands to God, and what else did they do? Did they have their head to God? No, 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 no. They didn't have their head to God. They didn't have their head to God. They lifted their hands, and they bowed their head. Does that make a difference? Yes. Yeah then don't you ever kneel again if you say that don't make a difference. Everything makes a difference. It's led by the Spirit of God. You say, oh, where is that in New Testament? I'll give you another one. Jesus spit on the ground and made mud and put it in people's eyes. Was that not led by the Spirit of God? Well, that's a little weird. When was the last time you saw anybody do that? But truly, was not that the Spirit of God? We can try to reason and say there was all types of vitamins in the ground and, and this and that in the ground, and that's what the guy needed. Oh, humbug. Was he not led by the Spirit of God? And didn't he do a weird thing? And the guy was there blind, and he put it in his eyes, and he says, now... Will you imagine what the guy would say? Oh, my eyes, my eyes, my eyes. What did you do to me? What did you do to me? And he says, go wash your eyes in the pool of Bethesda. So he, rent, he went and he washed his eyes. What have you done? And then his eyes were opened. What did you put in them? Get a load of this. If you think wearing a prayer shawl is just way below you. That Jesus spit on a guy's tongue. When was the last time you did that? And he spoke. Stick your tongue out. Uh, uh. Bam! Hallelujah! First time he ever spoke. Don't you tell me that what I'm saying here today there are times I'll lift my hands to the Lord, but I just feel as though I shouldn't look up, and I look down in all humility to God. God, have mercy on me. The guy in the temple, the Pharisee, you remember the Pharisee? I thank you, God, I am not like this sinner. But he wouldn't even look up. He wouldn't even look up. He wouldn't even look up. And what did he do? He just smote his breast. You tell me that didn't mean anything. That don't, mean, that don't mean anything. He smote his breast. I don't have to sm smite my breast. Are you not a sinner that you're not worthy to even look up? Are you not? Don't you need God's attention? In areas of your life, you go, golly, I have failed the Lord. I have not walked with Jesus. Don't you ever feel like I need to bow my head before the Lord and smote myself and say, God, God, woe is me. Is there anyone here that cannot say that, that they have times that they needed to say, woe is me? Well, they don't teach that in our church. And by golly, I'm not doing it. Then you just do what you want to do. But I, I believe God is telling us here today that the depths of the Spirit of God that wants to unlock and give you a key to unlock doors that never were unlocked you need to think about it. Some people say, well, I, f I fasted and I prayed. And I, and I didn't eat or drink. Was God leading you in that? There's always a blessing, but it's maybe not the blessing that you were looking for. Did you, where you felt that I am sad in the spirit, and did you release that to God? Oh, I released it. How'd you release it? Well, I just... You know, like people say, I got such a problem. I just released it to the Lord. No, you just chose not to deal with it. And you started thinking about mowing the lawn. You, thought, think, you started thinking about doing something else, but you really didn't deal with it. The Spirit of God was inside you wanting you to cry to God. But you held back the tears. You held back the groaning. You held it all back. And a couple hours later, you felt fine. You felt good about things. But the fact of the matter was, is that it wasn't your hormones that changed or anything like that. It was God that said, you resisted me.
and you didn't get what you needed. And you perished for lack of what? Knowledge. knowledge. You perished for lack of knowledge. Does God change? Well, I've always prayed like this. Maybe it's time that we go to the deeper things of God. There was a prophet that said, I can't get in the spirit. And he prayed to God and he says, God, send a trumpeter. Send a trumpeter. He couldn't get in the spirit. He couldn't get into the first level of prayer to find out how he should pray or what he should do. He couldn't get in the spirit with the spirit of God would take him and lead him into his prayer and into, his, into the presence of God. And he says, I need somebody that can play an instrument. You hearing me? That's what's necessary. I need somebody to play for me an instrument. When Jan started pray, uh, playing this morning, before we all started, the Spirit of God, I, I knew the Spirit of God is here. It's kind of like I know God's here. I know he's everywhere. But when she started playing, I started prophesying. But not until she started playing. Nobody was here. Until she started playing, the Spirit of God was not on me to prophesy and to speak to me. Did God want to speak to me? Yes, he did. But he needed her at the organ. Amen. Keyboard. He needed her there for me to get in the Spirit. What should I do, Pastor? That is what you should do. To get a prayer answered. What should I do? James said, anoint with oil. Anoint with oil. So all we do is anoint with oil. We don't lift our hands. We don't kneel. We just anoint with oil. Really. Is that what God wants? Is that how God wants you to do it? But surely he does. Yes, he does. He wants you to anoint with oil. So they anointed with oil, and they prayed the prayer of faith, and they were healed. Can you see that there's all different facets of God? You need God. You need the Spirit of God to rule in your life. To rule in your life. Amen. Level of commitment determines the outcome. How committed are you to this? To follow God. Cornelius was one also. Now you got to listen to this. Got to listen to this. A devout man, one that feared God with all his house. All his house feared God. A devout man, one that feared God, and all his house feared God too. Sounds like Cornelius was in control of his house. Is there a blessing with that? Yes, there is. And this is what God, God said. With all his house, which gave much alms to the people, gave money to the people, and prayed to God, how? Always. 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 Prayed to God always. Doesn't say, he, doesn't say he anointed with oil. Doesn't say he did anything. But his whole household served the Lord. He wouldn't have it any other way. If he found a servant that wouldn't serve God, he's out. Amen? He found one. And that was one of the criteria to come and work for him is that he, he, he or she had to be one mind, one spirit. You're not going to be in this house. You're not going to be in this congregation. All right. So anyway, he prayed always. And that's when... It all came up before the Lord. It all came up before the Lord. As he was praying, it all came up before the Lord. You see the price that's paid here. I want you to see this. The price that's paid is that they always gave. The price that was paid, the level of commitment, that way he prayed always. He was always. Well, I'm in an attitude of prayer. Really? Are you praying? Well, no, I'm just in the attitude. Like, I could pray any time. <laughs> right but you're not praying and you're not fasting you maybe are but I'm just saying some people but he was always in prayer and he was always giving and all his house feared the Lord and while he was in prayer about the ninth hour an angel came in I'm going to tell you and the angel says Cornelius everything that you've done all these years the level of commit you, m commitment you had it has come up to God as a memorial before him. Now what was the memorial? All the years. All the years. That God would visit his place, but it was all the years. 
all the years of service. It came up to God. It came up before God, and God says, now numbered all the years, he says, looks like about 30 years to me. The angel says, it sure is, God. And so he says, go back and tell Cornelius and appear to him. So he's praying. It scared the heebie-jeebies out of him. And the, and the angel says, don't be afraid, Cornelius, for everything you've done has come up as a memorial before God. And he says, oh, oh, oh. You know what I said about Jan playing that? He says, oh, uh, it isn't good enough that you confess Jesus as Lord. Uh, you got to go get Simon. He's at the, Simon the Tanner's place, two Simons in the house. So he went to that house, found Peter in a trance, up on top the roof. And there he was. He was, he was praying to God, and he saw in a trance, he says, hey, the Gentiles too. All the footed, you know, the unclean beast came down. He says, everybody's okay. Everything's okay. So he says, there's a guy here that wants to talk to you. So he sent his servants. Hey, hey, he sent his servants. You got a servant? Do you wish you had a servant? <laughs> you can see kind of where we stand. None of us have any servants. Amen. We got a chief, but no braves. We order people around the house, but we don't have anybody to order around. Amen. And when we do order them, they says, I'm not doing that anyway. So anyway, he went and got Peter. Peter started preaching the gospel. And what happened? Everybody got saved by it. They got filled with the Holy Ghost, too. And they all spoke in tongues. You go, when was the last time you saw that? When was the last time you really wanted that to happen in your life? When was the last time you wanted that to happen in your children's life? That the Spirit of God would overflow in them. They'd raise the dead and they'd preach fiery sermons. When was the last time? But what is the level of commitment that you've had? That where, is, where's your memorial? You got one? You got one? It, where's the memorial? Oh, I don't have any. Well, you got something. You got something. If you're not dead yet, you can start building on it, amen? Who knows what the Lord will do? Who knows what the Lord will do in your life? You see the commitment, the level of commitment that Cornelius had to have in his whole house, the servants and everybody. Yeah, he was a man that had some money too. I didn't think God even blessed people like that. Well, sure he does. It's a level of commitment towards the Lord. Herod kills James. Herod kills James, James and John, the sons of thunder, right? He kills him. And he sees that it pleases the Jews. So we went and got Peter and threw him in jail. He was going to kill him. But what went up? What went up? I want you to see this. What was the level of commitment that was needed? It said the church started praying for him and did not cease praying for him. And an angel appeared and got Peter out of there. They're going to kill you. Leave town. The church started praying all night. Where are we at on the all night praying? Where are we at on the all night praying? We are strong, but the devil makes us feel weak. We open up our Bibles to read and we fall asleep. Or we only read our favorite verses that we have highlighted. How about some of the others? Amen? I want you to see that I believe God wanted me to talk to you today about your level of commitment to him, your depth, understanding, understanding in the Lord. Some people cry before the Lord. They cry before the Lord, and it's because they feel bad. They just feel bad, and it's a them thing. And you know, I'm not saying that that's totally wrong, but when was that you felt good and you got into prayer and you just really started feeling sad? And you cried before the Lord. And then once you cried, and once you pressed in, it left you. And you came back to yourself again, how you were. That's what we're looking for. That's what we're looking for. We're looking for more than, God help me. We're looking for more than that. We're looking for some answers to prayer. And this is what God did. Remember Elijah, would God have you do something crazy? Remember Jesus, would God have you do something crazy? Where is God in it? He's not in the practical things sometimes. Not usually. A lot of times not. Sometimes is. You ever see a congregation? Somebody's going to sing a song, and it's really a song before the Lord. Everybody just sits down. 
where people would stand and they get their hands like this. Oh, you're so reserved. You look like everybody at a funeral. I remember when I was a little boy, all the men were like this, standing one, towards a, one with another with their wives, and they were all like this. It's a nice and pious little thing, you know? But is really that the thing to do? Are we at a funeral? Or should we lift holy hands to the Lord? I remember when I was out at one church, I wanted to lift my hands, and I thought, oh, my golly, they'll just freak out. They all had the songbooks. Buried in their songbooks because there nobody see us singing. Really? Once in a while you'd see a woman go like that. She's the spiritual one. We're all supposed to be somewhat. We're spiritual. All right, hang in there with me. You're not falling out of a window yet. Jesus was going to be tempted by the devil. Remember the temptation? The Spirit of God. Spirit led him to the wilderness. We know that. How did he get ready? How did he get ready for the temptation? Hmm? Fasting. How long did he fast? To get ready for the temptation? 40 days. Was it? Then the devil came. But then he was ready. Now he's ready. Now he's ready. If he would have fell, there would have been no salvation. God tried him, tested him. What did he do? What was the level? He knew it going in. I can't eat for 40 days. What if the Lord told you that? Some people, I know, people have done that. They have said, well, I, I didn't eat for 40 days. No, you ground hamburger up and you made Slurpees. <laughs> you still ate. I just ground it up. I did it. Was, I had no solid food. Whatever. But the thing was that Jesus fasted for 40 days. He fasted for 40 days. He got, was getting ready for the temptation. He was getting ready for the temptation. What if he only fasted 10 days? What if he only fasted 10 days? What if he only fasted five days? What if he was like us and just fasted one meal and said, oh, this is just too hard. Mary, give me that pizza from the Giarno's. Get one out of the freezer. <laughs> what if he did that? We know he wouldn't have been ready, right? But where are we at? Aren't we kind of like that? Honey, I'm going to fast. And she says, I've made your favorite dish. <laughs> I'll fast after the dish. <laughs> See? So what would you say there? I know that I'm going to face something. I need to fast and get ready for it. Right? I know something is coming, so I need to fast. And Jesus was led by the Spirit on the 40-day deal. Amen. So the level of commitment determines the outcome. But what's the level of commitment? What is God saying to you? I told you to take the oil and anoint, but you didn't. You thought it was dumb, and your prayer wasn't answered. You mean, God, it was that one thing? It was the oil? It was the oil? I know a, a church that just slaps oil on everybody. God says, I'm not talking about that church. I'm talking to you. Right now, this prayer, right now. Now, I'll tell you kind of where we're at sometimes. We, this is where we're at, and this is how out of tune we get sometimes. We think, well, let's try it, see if it works. <laughs> Rather than knowing I'm led by God, I really believe this is God, even though you miss it sometimes, and I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to anoint you with oil because I truly believe I'm supposed to do this. And all once your prayers hurt. So then the church adopts a doctrine Everybody gets oil all the time. Wrong doctrine. Can I just say this much? Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication. You ever kind of wonder what the supplication part is? We know what the prayer is. 
God, help me. <laughs> this is bad. God, send your healing there and there. What, but what's the supplication part? Really, with prayer and supplication. It's everything that I was talking. Strong prayer, beseeching, strong beseeching, pleading, pleading is supplication. This is what Paul said. Don't worry about anything, but with everything, in everything, pray. With strong prayer, beseeching the Lord, pleading with God, begging the Lord. That's what that means. And then he says one thing, with thanksgiving. You're not on the outside with God, you're on the inside with the Lord. You are not above begging God. Good master, have mercy upon me. Good master, my servant lies at home close to death. Good master, my child is ready to die. Come quickly. And what did they do? They came to him and said, she's dead. Don't bother, bother the master any farther. What did Jesus say? You're on the inside. Don't listen to him. Show me where she's at. You're on the inside. But how is it that you're to do? He went to Jesus, begging Jesus to come his daughter begging, supplicating for that Jesus would have compassion. And he says, take me to her. And there was a woman that said, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I'll be made whole on the way. If you can just get to God, yes, through the cross, you have access. You have ability to get to the throne of God. Cover yourself with the blood and don't be ashamed. That's what that boldly means. And beseech the Lord with strong, with strong prayer. And let the Spirit of God plead your case through you, through you, with prayer and crying, if it's needed, if the Spirit of God is moving on you. How can you tell it that if it's not God? Go with the flow. You'll learn God by going with the flow. And just remember Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane with strong prayer and crying. He prayed to God. And he was strengthened do God's will. An angel appeared and strengthened him to do God's will. The hardship that he had to do and go through. Is there a hardship in your life that you need to do? And you would say, God, I need strength to do this. Is there a hardship? How about just like praying to God for two hours? Is there a heart? They might say, that's a hardship for me. Do you need help? Pray that you, you're able to do what you need to do before the Lord. Oh, I'm praying that I'll be able to go to work and I'll be able to do those things that you do. How much more with prayer that you need to be led by the Spirit of God more than what you are? The, the, those are the things you need to be crying to God about. You ever feel like your prayer life just really isn't where it's supposed to be at all? So wouldn't it be right that you would ask the Spirit of God, the Bible says, talk to the Spirit of God, commune with the Holy Ghost. Paul says, help me, help me, help me, help me. I need you. I need your help. I'm not even going to the Father yet. I need you.
You did a right thing. You did a right thing to help you. See, okay. We cool? See how you needed the highlights? You'll say, what was that I should do? What was that I should do? God says, well, I really want you to bow your head and lift your hands. Oh, yes. And what, does that make any difference? Don't, don't be fooled now. Don't be fooled in thinking that doesn't mean anything to God. Is it right that I would give thanks to God and rejoice in the Lord? Oh, pastor, we know we love that. I know you do. Some people don't, though. Would it be right that you would do that when God wants you to do that and give thanks to the Lord and rejoice in God? Well, we don't rejoice in this house for anybody. <laughs> we just... Put the axe to things. <laughs>